Chapter 6. First Light In the back of his mind, Pierre heard a low growling, then the sound of claws digging into tree, tree bark. I must be dreaming, he thought, pulling his blanket tighter around his shoulders. His head ached even worse than it had the night before. He was just drifting back to sleep when a second growl came. A bear. Pierre's eyes flashed open. Crouched at the base of a pine was André Bellegarde, scratching the bark with his bear claws necklace. Ha ha! Blois cackled from behind. He trotted to Pierre's side and leaned directly over his face. Portage time, he croaked, his black eyes glittering. Say goodbye to your pretty dreams. Blois's breath smelled of stale liquor, and his mutilated nose was even uglier than Pierre dreamed it, remembered it. Go away, Pierre said. But Beloit and Bellegarde picked up the canoe that had been Pierre's shelter for the night. Pierre blinked as bits of leaves and sand fell onto his face. While the men carried the canoe away, Pierre focused his sleep's swollen eyes. It was still dark, but the canoes were all gone. The few men who remained in camp were picked, picking up parcels from the pile at the end of the beach and starting up the trail. Pierre scrambled to his feet. He stuffed his blanket into his pack and hurried over to help with the work. His muscles were sore and his right hand was raw and aching. It's time for work, Greybeard, Beloit greeted him. When he got to the pile of parcels, we were ready to leave you for bear bait, Mr. McKay said. Good afternoon, lad. I hope you weren't waiting for us to bring you breakfast in bed. Pierre's cheeks were hot. His head pounded. His lips felt dry and cracked, and his mouth tasted as if it were filled with sawdust. Beloit helped Lalonde hoist his double packs in place. Lalonde paused a moment to adjust his tump line and wink at Pierre. He patted the boy on the shoulder and grinned. It's an easy carry, son, he said, trotting off with his usual stringy stride. I think we start you with one pack today. Beloit reached for a parcel. His hair was still plastered with bits of sand and leaves from sleeping on the ground. Pierre tried not to look at his face. No, give me the same as everyone, Pierre insisted, anxious to get away from Beloit as fast as he could. Whatever you say, Beloit heaved the first pack onto his back. The straps cut into Pierre's shoulders and jerked him backwards. He wheeled his arms to keep him from falling. Beloit grinned. Ready for another? Pierre gasped as he tottered to maintain his balance. I'll come back for the other one. As you wish, Beloit snickered, taking two packs for himself as Pierre started up the path. The trail was rugged. As Pierre stepped from one rock to the next, he tried not to imagine how embarrassing it would be to trip while carrying only a single pack. Before he was halfway up the ridge, La Petite passed him, stepping onto, into the bushes and back onto the trail without breaking stride. Three bundles were stacked on his back. Pierre multiplied three times ninety in his mind and couldn't believe La Petite carried that much weight without even slowing down. Beloit and another man, both portaging double packs, passed Pierre before he reached the crown of the spruce-covered hill. The straps cut into his shirt as if they were sharp metal bands and there was no way to relieve the pain. If he leaned into the tump line to take the weight off of his back, his neck muscles burned and his body pitched forward. If he hooked his thumbs under the straps to relieve the weight, his blisters grated against the canvas. Thankful for his strong legs, Pierre barely felt the load of his lower body until he was well over the rise. But, as he worked his way down the backside of the ridge, he suddenly wondered if he would make it. The muscles in his legs popped out with each step, and his calves burned. Knowing that he was the last one on the trail, he thought for a moment about tossing his pack into the brush. He could hike home in a day and be done with the pain for good. When Pierre noticed a mossy patch of ground ahead, he decided to rest a minute. But just then, he saw a bright patch of blue through the underbrush. Water. He held his pace, knowing that if the path turned rough again, he would never make it. The trail took a sharp turn to the left and suddenly got steeper. Pierre groaned, but there was no stopping now. Partway down the hill, he looked up. The entire crew stood in attention below, facing him. Pierre heard taunts and jeers inside his, heads, inside his head, yet the men just stared, strangely silent. As Pierre leaned into the trumbline, 
he saw La, P- La Petite whisper something to Lalande. Both men grinned. I'll show them, he silently vowed. Throwing caution aside, he doubled his pace, risking a headlong tumble. His legs gave out as he reached the shore. La Petite caught him under the arms as the under under the arms as the weight of Pierre's pack twisted his body around and jerked him backwards. His feet flew up and he nearly rolled into the river. Suddenly the men cheered. La Petite helped Pierre out of his pack straps and onto his feet. Several men stepped forward and clapped him on the back. He was folk confused even more when Charbonneau stepped forward and shook his hand saying, Fine carry, son. Good job, lad. McKay tipped his hat. You showed him, Lalonde said, and Emile, who had thrown his cap in the air, patted Pierre on the shoulder. Pierre's head throbbed, and he was confused by all the attention. It wasn't until Pierre saw Beloit toss a coin to La Petite that he finally figured things out. Pierre knelt to examine his pack. He lifted the flap, and a handful of musket balls rolled out. Someone had stuffed his pack with bags of lead shot. He wondered how many had bet against him his making it. Pierre took one of the heavy balls in his hands and stood up. His knuckles went white as he squeezed the bullet in his palms. How stupid could he be? A lucky carry, Beloit said, spitting into the rocks at Pierre's feet as he stepped towards the waiting canoes. A man-sized portage would have flattened him. I told them you'd make it, La Petite says, but they refuse to believe. Their doubt has cost them dearly. He paused and rattled the newly won coins in his palm. If that pact weighed an ounce, it weighed 200 pounds. The musket ball's ball dropped from Pierre's hand onto the black rocks. You mean it weighs as much as a double pack? Without a doubt, my young voyager. Young, I'll believe, Beloit snarled as he turned to climb into his canoe. As for voyager, we shall see. But Pierre was looking at his pack, amazed at what he'd done. La Petite gave Pierre one more clap on the back and waded out to his canoe. The big man collected on a few more wagers after he had taken his place in the stern. He turned towards Pierre one last time, raising his leather coin pouch high and jingling it by its drawstrings. See me at the next portage, Pierre, he called. I give you a share of the winnings. I've got a little something for you, too, Lalonde said, waving his paddle at Pierre. We pick our ponies pretty well, eh, partner? He bragged to the men in the other canoes. If we get much luckier... We'll have to give up our voyager voyaging and open a bank. Despite the chorus of boos from middlemen who'd lost money in the betting, Charbonneau's canoe was underway a moment later. As they started upriver, Lalande took up an old French folk song. Behold the fair Francois, behold the fair Francois. She would wed if she may, Malaroon Lorette. She would wed if she may, Malaroon Lorette. Her love comes late a-calling, her love comes. At the chorus, Pierre joined in. Pulling as hard on his paddle as his blisters would allow, he was glad to ta- have his first portage behind him, but he was uneasy about the carries that lay ahead. <laughs>